And welcome back, Karen Wilkinson with us. Karen, if people who are listening to this program believe that they too have been abducted, who do they turn to? Where do they go? Yeah, that's a really good question. There aren't a lot of places out there for people to go. Um, one thing you can do, they can do, is reach out to me through my website, and I try really hard to get back to everyone who reaches out to me as quickly as I can. Um, I'm researching a couple of different um, organizations that offer um, to be there to counsel and talk to abductees, um, but I don't want to put anything on my website until I feel like I've vetted it fully. Um, and they can they can go and search and look um, for organizations because there are places out there that do offer um, help and counseling and support for abductees. Believe it or not, there are a lot more out there, I think, than most people realize. I think you're right. Tell me about the handler that you had. Uh, yeah, this was a um, gentleman who was with me pretty much throughout almost all of my abduction experiences. Um, he just kind of created a relationship with me and um we, you know, I got to know him very well. Um, was he an ET or a human? He was an ET. He appeared as human, but much later in life, um, as our relationship grew and um, I had a different type of relationship with him, he showed me his true form. And I can't say that I've seen, I've looked, I haven't found a picture of anything that looks quite like him, but he was reptilian in nature, and I describe him in the book as best I can. Um, and you felt comfortable with him? Very, very much so, yeah. Does he still come around? I'm sorry? Does he still come around? Um, only once in the last uh, couple of years to try to convince me to come back. And he looked very different. He looked sickly. Um, his Skin was no longer um, like he was aging. Kind of shiny, almost sparkly look to it, and it was matte colored, like a matte greenish color. He didn't look good, so I um, I don't know what that's about, but it was shocking how different he looked when I saw him the last time. And what do you mean by convince you to come back? Do you do you have the say so in this matter? Um, yes, I absolutely do because I'm protected by a higher power than than them by their creator. Well, at what at what point did you realize you're in control? And I, you know, I wouldn't say that I'm in control, but that my creator is in control, that God is in control, and so um, has give, gives us that authority, you know, through through my faith. Um, and I realized that. About five years ago. Interesting. Let's go to the phones. John is truck driving in Ohio, one of our favorite states. Welcome to the show. Hey, John. Hey, good morning, George, and, and good morning, Karen. I, I got a couple questions now. When you were pregnant through these pregnancies, did you carry them full term, or did they come back and take them like six, they, seven months? They, months? they took them, uh, John, at three months. Okay, so there was no, you, you didn't have a chance to be examined by a doctor here? I mean, did you did you go to a doctor here to see what was going on and maybe they could see what was going on to be examined? I did. Thanks, John. Those are great questions, and I love Ohio. Um, stay safe out there. I did go to doctors um, for these pregnancies, and the pregnancies were confirmed, um, you know, and that early in the pregnancy, they confirm your pregnancy. Sometimes you'll get to hear a heartbeat. You'll get your prenatal vitamin. Back then, you got a prescription. And things were a little you know, different back then. So I already had those pregnancies confirmed by doctors when when it happened. How many human children do you have, Karen? Um, I have three biological and five total. Now, when you say three biological and five total, what does that mean? <laughs> that I've uh, we've adopted a few along the way. Oh, you have. Okay. All right. <laughs> 
And then three hybrids that you know of. That I know of, yes. Interesting. But at no time did they ever try to take you physically to a different planet? Not that I am aware of, no. That doesn't mean that didn't happen. It just means I don't have a memory of that at all. And uh, Or if they did, I didn't know that's where I was, and I wasn't told that, but no. Did you ever have nightmares about this? Um, I have, yeah. I've had uh, some nightmares. I don't fully remember them except that waking up from a nightmare about something that happened. Have they gone away now? Mm, not really. Uh-huh. Mostly, yes. Occasionally, I'll still have them. Well, well, okay, so these things still happen every once in a while. Yes, yes. Did you feel violated? Absolutely. Let's go to Aaron in Fountain Valley, California. Thanks, Aaron. Go ahead. Hey, George. Thanks so much for taking my call. You truly are the Nighthawk. Uh, the thank one you, and only. I love it. Um, uh, Karen, I am interested in the male aspect of that, of whether it, it, what your insight is into whether it could happen to someone like me and whether it happens in your sleep, like you might not even know it and, and possibly what you, your thoughts are on that. Yeah, could they get to a male and take his DNA and take what he has to do, take in, uh, in order to create hybrids, Karen? Uh, hi, yeah, thanks, Aaron. That's a great question. Absolutely, yes. And I have a couple of male friends. Um, two of them were in L.A. Marzulli's movie, uh, the fourth one, um, who have had exactly that happen. Interesting take on that. There could be thousands and thousands of hybrids, Karen. There absolutely could be. I mean, this is going on for so long, and there are so many people here on this planet to work with as well. So, you know, we have no idea. And if they're walking among us at this point, they could look so much like us that we wouldn't be able to pick them out of a crowd. Is it possible that this is a program to replace us? I think that's entirely possible. You know, it's unfortunate because anything about that I say would be speculation because they haven't shared that with me. But, you know, if if they wanted to, they certainly would be able to with the numbers they could have. Let us go to Brendan in Austin, Texas. Hey, Brendan, go ahead, buddy. Thank you, Karen and George. Uh, Very interesting. Thank you. Uh, All the shows tonight and this week have been great. Uh, different hybrids Thanks. are maybe different tools, right? you got to use a different tool for the right job. Uh, I saw a gray one time, and it was uh, kind of negative and definitely deceptive, I can tell you, but I think that there was, like, positive things helping us. And I had two coworkers who they don't really know that I'm curious about this topic. They were, like, newer. All the people that are have been there forever, I mean, they know me, but <laughs> – uh, the, they told me that they were both in Seguin, and they independently told me this, like months apart, if not a year or more apart, both in Seguin, Texas, which is nearby, in like whitley Strieber type area where I live in. And they said, one told me that there was a gray in their living room she saw crossing the living room, and the other one told me that there are orbs that come down and that the coyotes will go into a frenzy and that they start screaming, and it sounds like they're eating each other alive or panicking like a crazy frenzy you've never even imagined. But um, how do people know if they're being abducted or if they have been abducted? And then what did you think about Whitley Strieber, who I have a lot of respect for, I'm sure everybody does, doing a circle with his book Communion, uh, which, you know, means coming together. And then he was pretty trepidatious about ETs and probably still is and cautious for a while. And then he kind of has come back around and on Twitter in his latest book and on Coast to Coast, he's talking about E.T. helping us and stuff like that. And I think having evolving views is healthy and natural regarding this topic. But And then these are more rhetor- rhetorical. You don't have to answer them. This is just for thoughts. But if greys are as evil as you had felt, why do you think that they came, that they let you tell the story instead of eliminating you? And could the hybrids have been upset with you because they felt abandoned by you? that you didn't go with them, that they're, they're your mom 
that you're their mom and you didn't go with them. And when you cried out, uh, Jesus, that they realized that they were upsetting you or hurting you and let you go. Those are great questions. Wow, that was a lot, Brandon, and um, some interesting stuff. Um, I'm in Texas, too, so I'm aware of a lot of the places that you talked about. Um, you asked um, why, you know, they if they were not benevolent, then why didn't they eliminate me hurt when you, yeah. I decided to write the things that I wrote? Because I'm protected by a power higher than they are. Brendan, I am protected by the Most High. And they know that, don't they? Yeah. And I've watched them back away, and they they can't touch me, and they know it. Not that they haven't tried. Trust me, they have. But I've got a good friend named Vicki Joy Anderson who wrote a book called They Only Come Out at Night, and she has helped me with um, Breaking Covenants and things like that. She's just amazing. I think she's going to be an upcoming guest on our program. She is. I think she's on on October 30th. And she's been on before, I believe, too. So yep. Yep. She's amazing. Another one of L.A. Marzulli's friends, um, good friends. Um, and so that that's what happened there. And I think, you know, I, I that's a really good point. You know, do I think that the hybrids felt bad that maybe they were hurting me when they called out when I called out to Jesus' name? Now, the issue I have with that is that, you know, they were standing there not offering me love, not offering me kindness, not offering me, "Hey, mom, we love you. Will you come with us? Do you want to be with us?" There was none of that. It was come with us. It was done with no kindness or love whatsoever. There was no love and light there. Just no emotion. No emotion. Well, there was some emotion. It was evil. It was just negative towards me. Hmm. It was like they hated me. Let's I go mean, to... you could just feel this seething hate come off of them. And I was shocked by that because the second I saw them, I was like, oh, these are my kids. And the first thing I felt was love. The first thing I wanted to do was embrace them and just jump up and and be like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to get that chance, you know. And it makes me want to cry because that's the first thing I felt, and their response to me was not love. Their response was just disgust and disdain. And well, was, they didn't get those kind of genetics from you, so I wonder how they got that part. <laughs> right. Well, thank you for saying that. And, no, that just and that broke my heart, you know. Let's that go to Carol in Florida. Right. Go ahead, Carol. Carol? Hello. Go ahead, hon. Hello. Uh, well, who am I connected to? You were on the show, Carol. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yes, my daughter had a best friend who confided to her that she had been abducted and evidently was told she produced some sort of child through aliens, and that her father also, evidently it ran in the family. My daughter's friend was so fearful that she became very connected to the Catholic Church, you know, and wanted protection. Um, that is really all the information that I have, and this is import- This is an important topic and show. Did you believe her, Carol? I'm sorry, what? Did you believe the girl? Did I what? <laughs> Did you believe her? I do. I absolutely do. Yeah. And what do you think of that, Karen? Carol, um, good for you. Thank you for believing her. And, you know, if you have a chance to just be there for her, if she wants to talk about it, you know, the one thing that I can say for me and for my friends who've been in this situation, sometimes we just need someone to listen. Knowing that someone believes us because... These these are real things happening to people, and we've spent our lifetimes just being treated like we're making this up, and that in itself is just devastating. So thank you for believing your daughter's friend. Let's go to Joe in Monterey, California. Hey, Joseph, go ahead. Thank you for taking my call, George. Thank you, Joe. Uh, well, I want to congratulate your guests for coming out and writing books. And, and getting uh, into the public eye, it takes a lot of courage. It does. 
They uh, they make you forget, by the way. They can control your memory. They can make you forget. If you were abducted when you were young, it may come out in your dreams if you don't remember the actual experience. It may come out in dreams later on in life. Um, I feel that what you were holding did not have a soul. It didn't have a soul because a soul wouldn't really want to incarnate into an abomination like that. Maybe they're kind of keeping it alive through your energy of love. And also, uh, they want someone to bond. And they want, like you said, they want a spokesperson for their agenda. And we have them on the earth. There are people that really believe that, oh, no, they're really good. No, none of the grays are good, really. Uh, there's only one race, and, and that explores the earth for crystals and information like that. But these, these are, um, this is an abomination completely. Now, I want to ask you, um, did, you uh, did you get more information through your dreams? And also, um, they don't leave us, George. Once you're tagged, they will watch. They may not interfere, but if you're going to do something that really exposes them, like get out, take out an implant, because I used to have an implant in a certain place, and I was thinking of getting it changed uh, or taken out, and uh, it disappeared. It moved, mm-hmm. and the skin was uh, covered over. So they that had happens. to be uh, monitoring my thoughts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, did you feel? Do you ever feel a presence and not see them because they are very curious? By the way, do you feel that presence still, Karen? You know, I do sometimes, yes, but the funny thing is now is that it's always outside of my home and never inside of my home. So I have this beautiful protection always around me and inside my home now. So I'm, you know, very, very grateful for that. Interesting takes. And give out L.A. Marzulli's website once again, Karen. Yes, his website is L.A. Marzulli, L A M A. R Z is in zebra U L L I dot net. That's L A Marzuli dot net. How did you stay so strong, Karen, through all this adversity? I didn't. You know, I've had my breakdowns. I have had some incredible challenging incredibly challenging times and I write about that in my book too, that um there are times where I'm honestly surprised I'm still here, but... Uh, Were you depressed? Oh, definitely. So yeah. you've, you've been through a lot then. Yeah, it was a lot. It was a lot. But, you know, one of the things that's always kept me going is, is my family and the kids and just love. And your faith as well. My faith is the number one thing. Karen, we're going to come back and wrap things up with you in just a moment here on Coast to Coast AM. Karen's website linked up at coasttocoastam.com, and you can get to L.A. Marzulli's website through hers to make it easy for you to pick up the book, Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. And welcome back to our final segment with Karen Wilkinson. Karen, so where do you go next with this story? What do you do? You've got the book out. You go to conferences. What next can you do? Um, well, I'm going to talk to as many people as I can, help as many people as I can, answer as many questions as I can, and then see where God leads me next. And it will probably take you to higher mountains, don't you think? Probably, uh, yeah. We uh, make plans and God laughs, so yes. <laughs> and I'll go wherever he sends me. Well, you stay safe out there, all right? Absolutely, I will. All right. Thanks, Karen. appreciate you being on the program. The name of the book is called Stolen Seed, Evil Harvest. It's available on L.A. Marzulli's website, which you can get to by going to Karen's at coasttocoastam.com. For some people, demons and entities seem to be a problem as well. And if you need a clearing, there's no better one than the spiritual warrior, Bill Bean. Bill, let's talk about that other case of possession that uh, is in the book, uh, The Connection, if you would, please. Absolutely. And George, I'd like to, if we have a moment after that, I'd like to mention uh, briefly a couple recent ones that I feel you would probably be very interested in hearing about. Absolutely. Uh, But let me speak about this really quickly. Um, This one 
took place on March 31st, 2018 in Orlando, Florida. And uh, I arrived at the home and, you know, George, usually I can feel, and again, I don't claim to be anything, but God does give me a knowing of things. He has bestowed gifts, I'll say it that way, upon me. And I could sense evil right away, you know, pulling up and getting out of the, the rental car. And um, as I'm walking up the walkway, you know, I could I could sense it. I could feel evil present. And the... Uh, it was a very nice family, and, and the the lady of the house was the one being affected. And she, too, had some suffering in her childhood, and she was exposed to uh, Santeria mm-hmm. and Santeria uh, curses, which is, you know, it's like a Caribbean voodoo. And so she had exposure to that and was victimized by that as a child. And so she had been having on and off bouts of what she believed was demonic possession over the years. I think it was just a a strong oppression that eventually did turn into a possession. And I didn't even think that until it was time to perform the deliverance. So I'm sitting there with her and her husband, very nice lady. He's a very nice man. Uh, Met the kids. Everything seemed well between all of them. We're talking. Um, and the more we talked, the closer it was getting to the time at hand of the deliverance. Hmm. So I asked her husband to go up and, and fill the tub that I was going to ask her to stand in the water. I was going to bless the water first. I was going to ask her to stand in that water and I was going to perform the deliverance over her while she was standing in that blessed holy water. So everything was going according to plan until we got into the bathroom. When it was time for her, after I said the prayer, and I could notice when we were going up the steps, her body language, you know, it was changing, that she was becoming nervous and apprehensive. And, you know, and again, you think, okay, well, this person's going to be a little nervous. I mean, something like this is about to happen. You know, they're going to be disturbed by it. So I'm blessing the water, and now it's time for her to get in. And all of a sudden, George, it takes her over, and it becomes a physical struggle. And her husband, he was right there, and he did assist me. He stayed right there with me, and we had to physically subdue her and get her into the uh, tub And my goodness, was it ever a struggle. Same thing, spitting on me, trying to bite me. Cursing. Her eyes changed to black. Um, There were voices coming out of her, and she, her tongue looked like, it was like a serpent. It was coming out and going all over the place. It was just unfathomable. And then she started, it it wasn't her, it was those demonic uh, entities Mm -hmm. in her. They were screeching and screaming. I can't believe that the neighbors didn't call the police. That's how loud this was. And so, again, I had to be unwavering in, you know, what God was having me to do. And I continued, even with that screeching, and I continued to take power and authority over it every time I did that it would stop and then it would start back up again. So this was a battle back and forth for quite a while. And uh, to make a long story short, God did work through me to deliver her from it. And when she was delivered, she vomited everywhere. And that happens sometimes, George. It comes up through the mouth like that. And uh, after that happened, she was delivered. And then, you know, God bless her husband. He cleaned all of that up and we had to put fresh water in there, sure. and I re-blessed the water and then baptized her in that, and she's been great ever since, thank God. But let me tell you, I will never, ever forget that day. And it seems like she was calm, and then something really kicked her into high gear. What would have done that? I think what it was is the entities knew it was time for eviction. Aha. Uh-huh. So when okay. it's time for eviction, you know, they're going to hold on and fight with everything that they have because they don't want to go. They were fighting they you. A, yes. They have a host body, 
And that's what they want. And when they can get into a person like that and have that level of control, they don't want to go anywhere. So I am definitely, you know, a mortal enemy to these demonic forces. And again, it's by the power of God that I'm even still alive, George, because I believe that if if the devil would have had his way, he'd have killed me a long oh, time see, ago. That's, by the power of God, I'm still alive. That's what I asked you if you've ever been attacked or hurt. You've been yeah. very fortunate. Yes. Absolutely. Can we can can we say you were lucky? Well, I, I would say blessed. Uh, you know, I'm definitely under God's full blessing, and and I am not perfect. I don't claim to be perfect. I try to do the best that I could do and be the best that I could be each and every day of my life because I have to be somebody to and for somebody every day of my life. So I can't let down, and so I thank God and praise God for that. Um, and I will say this as well, that my life is 50 times more blessed than it's ever been cursed. And I could never thank God and praise God enough for that. Let's talk about a couple other little cases you had mentioned. Then we'll get into the Mandela effect, and then we'll take calls with you, Bill. What okay. uh, what other cases um, did you happen to have? I want to talk with you about something that took place on November 18th, this uh, 2018. And... Uh, your webmaster has it posted on the Coast to Coast site, a couple of those photographs. And this took place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And this took place uh, at the home of a family that I had already helped. I'd previously been there. I love them dearly. They're, they're like family to me now. And, and I feel that way about all my clients. I, you know, after this is over with, I try to be there for them and do anything that I can for them and, and always be there and somebody that could comfort them and help them to move forward. So this is Anita Tetzel and her son, Chris Levis, um, great people. Anyway, they started having problems again, and they asked if I could come back, which I did. And again, I sensed the presence of evil when I entered into the home, really walking up the walkway as well, but I entered in. Now, usually, George, I would never ask someone to do this uh, because most people, they don't want to document. They don't want to take photographs. They don't want video. They're very embarrassed and ashamed by it. They don't want people to know it. But on this occasion, I felt that God was urging me to say to Chris, I want you to stand behind me as I'm going through this house. And they'd have... They had had severe demonic problems in the past that God worked to me to deliver them mm-hmm. and to get rid of the garbage out of the home, and somehow it had come back in. And so I asked Chris, I said, I want you to walk behind me as I'm going through the house and just take random photographs. I really believe that you're going to capture some things in these photographs. And so, sure enough, he captured many images, uh, two that I believe to be divine angels, and then the rest I I believe to be demonic, and uh, one in particular, which is on your Coast to Coast website, was this face, and I mean, it's very clear. It's very clearly uh, defined. It looks like a demonic entity, and if you look closer at it, it looks like fangs. Oh, it's horrible looking. It's horrible. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, out of the right side of the mouth, and um, so this was in the basement of the home. It looks and like Frankenstein, the face, exactly, doesn't it? Exactly, George. Exactly. And I mean, that's one of the most defined pictures that I've ever seen of what I believe to be a demon. And so I was drawn over to the uh, chimney area, and part of that house was built in the 1800s. And there was like a little pot belly stove uh, connected to this, this chimney area you know, down in the basement. And it was a block wall. And I felt that there was a portal there. So this is something that I didn't discuss with you earlier that I should have, is that not only, you know, do I have to, by the power of God, bind and rebuke and cast out demonic forces, but I also have to close the portals as well, because there are portals everywhere. That's not easy. Travel. No, it's not. And, And so I'm standing there in front of this block wall, where God had led me to, where I believed a large portal was. And I'm binding and rebuking and closing the portal. And as I'm doing this, George, just as you're hearing my voice now, this 
groan, growl type of thing came out from within the block wall. Anita and Chris were standing right there with me. We all heard it clearly. And so after hearing that, I had to jump right back into action and take power and authority and bind and rebuke it, cast out, and then it departed. But it was, again, something that you and the uh, listeners, you'd have to be there to see it and hear it for yourself to truly understand and appreciate what I'm saying. Let's take a few calls here for you, Bill, and we'll come back and talk more about these events and the Mandela effect as well. Let's go to Colleen in Red Bluff, California, to get things started. Hi, Colleen. Hi, George. Thank you. I thank you for taking my call. I'm actually kind of really nervous. Um, I was married for a long time to an abusive man, and there were many times, just to cut it short, abuse verbally, physically, mentally, whatever, and oh, sexually. And um, I can distinctly remember at least three or four times where I saw the face of Satan while he would be raping me and choking me, and I would have fought him off physically as hard as I could, and I was strong back then, and I mean, I would be sweating just out of energy trying to fight him off, and um, I just, I feel like I've been stuck, and I don't know if there's residual effects from that or whatever, but I know, I know. Do you feel possessed? I don't know if I feel possessed because I've done, I mean, I've single mom, four kids, raised them all, worked hard. And, and where is he? Know. He's done. He's gone, right? He died, yeah. He oh, died he died. Three, yeah, about three and a half years ago. But, I mean, I, we were divorced a long, long time ago. But, you know, I mean, God has been amazing in, in letting me raise my kids and everything that we went through. I mean, just a host of things. But um, personally, I just feel like i just not worthy. I don't know. I... I well, let's bring the expert in to talk with you. Bill, go ahead. And I'm very sorry that you've suffered in the way that you have. And I want you to know that God does love you, and God is with you, and God is for you. And I think it's time for you to start a new chapter, a new season in your life, making God first in your life, and have a real connection with Him, and allow Him to show you that you are somebody and you are worthy. So I would suggest to you that, and whether it's me or somebody else, find someone to help you with this type of spiritual, and this would be more of a spiritual cleansing for you. And I would also recommend that you'd be rebaptized as well and start a new chapter and a new season in peace, freedom, and victory. I want you to look forward and never look back. And you can get a hold of Bill through his website, Colleen, billbean.net, linked up at coasttocoastam.com. That's it. And, and God bless you. And if I can be of any assistance in any way, please, like George said, he just gave you the website. Don't hesitate. Let's go to Ed in uh, Hemp Hill, Texas. Ed, welcome to the program. George, it's such an honor to talk to you. Well, thank you, Ed. And Bill, when I was nine years old, my mother went to Kmart and bought a Ouija board. Oh, boy. Mm. Oh, boy. And, and, uh, she thought it was a game, I, right? I thought it was a game, yeah. And my brother, me and my brother played it. He was three years old and he was 12. And, uh, he died at 25 years old. Mm. Oh, my. And... Everybody in my family, except my father, he's 82, has died. I'm very sorry to hear that. And you think a lot of it was tied to that Ouija board, Ed? I think everything was tied to it. Anything happened that you could recollect for us when you were playing it? And how many times did uh, you and your brother uh, use the board? Oh, we'd mess with it every day. Every day. Oh, my gosh. Every day. It's a portal, Bill, isn't it? Stay away from those Ouija boards. Wow. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean Ladasur, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burroughs, Tim Banal, George Knapp, and Ian Punnett, I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.